Today we will continue with motional electromotive force, which we have learned this one during the last lecture. So what we have here, we have a O-shaped conductor, and then here we have a conducting rod, and we move that conducting rod to the right side with some certain velocity, and there is a magnetic field into the page, okay? Whenever we move the rod, an electromotive force and an associated current are induced within the system, within the circuit. But what is the origin of this induced EMF if we consider the magnetic forces acting on mobile charges in the conductor? We did not discuss this one during the last lecture. Here we have a conductor, okay? And here we have charges. So if you move the conductor to the right side or to the left side, there are magnetic forces acting on that charges due to the magnetic field and this movement. So today we will discuss this one. So I just take this road and concentrate on this one, okay? Now, there is no other conductor here, just this one, isolated moving road. We have a magnetic field. The direction of the magnetic field is into the page, okay? And we have positive charge within that conductor, let's consider. This is A point of the conductor, this is the B point of the conductor. When we move the road to the right at a constant velocity like this, this charge experiences a magnetic force with the magnitude given by QVB, charge of the particle and velocity and magnetic field. Okay. So what about the direction of the force? Direction of the force is given by the right-hand rule, and this is the direction of the force. Upward direction from B to A, this positive charge experiences a magnetic force given this that expression, okay? So we have, we have force from B to A acting on positive charges. So due to that positive, uh, due to that force, this positive charges will be collected here, okay? There is a force acting on the positive charges and they will be collected here. So you can consider that negative charges will be collected here. You have positive charges here, you have negative charges here due to that force. When we move the road to the right side, this constant velocity. So what do you expect here? Positive charges are collected here, negative charges are collected here. Then you can consider that there is an electric field from A to B to the opposite direction, right? Then due to that electric field, there is another force acting on the positive charges, which is given by Q times E, okay? and the direction of the electric force is opposite to the magnetic force. So um, with time, the magnitude of the positive charges are increased here, and then associated electric field is increased, and in equilibrium, magnetic force and electric force become equal to each other in equilibrium condition, okay? Then we have QE electric force is equal to QVB magnetic force. So if you cancel this Q by this Q, then we will have electric field is given by V times B. V is the velocity of the positive charge here and B is the magnetic field from us into the page and here we have the electric field due to the excess of positive charges, negative charges here, 
okay, we have electric field from A to B, and we have electric force from A to B. So then, since we have here a potential difference because positive charges accumulate at that end of the road and negative charges accumulate at that end of road, so we have electric field, then we have potential difference between A and B points, right? So this potential difference is given by VA minus VB, and it is also given by E times L. L is the length of that road, and E is the electric field from A to B, okay? Then what about E? Electric field is given by V times B, then put that V times B here, then we have potential difference between A and B given by VBL, velocity of the road, magnetic field, and length of the road, okay? This was just single road. But what happens if I put here a U-shaped conductor and then I close the circuit. So like this, we have considered forces acting on the positive charge on that road when it is isolated, okay, just single road. And now we put that road here. We have U-shaped conductor. Then we have a complete circuit, right? This is conductor, this is also conductor. We have a complete circuit. So what will happen? We have learned that there will be positive charges here and negative charges here. So what do you expect? Positive charges accumulate here, negative charges accumulate here, then there will be a current from positive to the negative, right? Like this. And then there will be an EMF and a current in the circuit due to that movement of the road. So this is called as motional electromotive force. And what is the magnitude of the EMF? Magnitude of the EMF is given by the potential difference between A and B. We have already calculated, which is given by VBL, and it is equal to VBL. This is the motional EMF, conductor length and velocity perpendicular to uniform B. This is the length of the conductor. This is the velocity of the road. This is the direction of the magnetic field into the page. Then this gives us motional EMF given by that expression. Do you have any question here? What about the direction of the current within that road? We have already seen that the movement of the positive charges within the, ro within the road from, from B to A, okay? You can consider that this is like a battery, okay? Remember the chapter which we have seen the batteries. So if you have battery, you have positive side of the battery. This is the negative side of the battery. Just make a circuit by putting a wire here on both sides of the battery. Then there will be a current from A to B, okay? From positive to negative. So this is the same mechanism. Just put this rod here, okay? And move it to the right side, then there will be force acting on positive charges on the road and then um, positive charges accumulate here at that end of the road and negative charges accumulate at that end of road then um, we have a circuit like this then uh, there will be emf and current in the circuit like this okay now we can generalize the concept of motional EMF 
for a conductor with any shape moving in any magnetic field, uniform or not, okay? But this is important. We will assume that the magnetic field at each point does not vary with time. If you choose a certain point, in that point, magnetic field will not change. It is like this. Here we have a shape, okay, like this one. So I let's consider that there's a magnetic field into the page and this is a conductor. You can fix one part of this one, velocity here at that part, and then this part is moving. I changed the shape. So this part has different velocity, different direction of velocity than this one. Okay, so you see if I change, change the shape of this one, each part of that conductor will have some certain velocity, okay, different from each other. So here we choose DL parts, okay, the element of the loop with the DL, and this has certain velocity. You can, you can um, move that part like this, and here we have another uh, element here, element of the loop, and you can move that part like this. You will, you can have that kind of velocity, okay? So then we have a general equation for the motional EMF for the element, very small element of the conductor, okay? This is very small element of conductor, and what is the EMF here due to the magnetic field and due to the movement of that part. So for a complete loop, for a closed loop, we have that expression, okay? Line integral over all elements of closed conducting loop here, all the L elements, then we have that equation. This is the length vector of conducting element. This is the magnetic field at position of element. So this is important. What we see here, uh, the magnetic field at each point does not vary with time. So look at that one. So magnetic field is constant here. Here you may have different magnetic field, but this is also constant, okay? When, when you are calculating the EMF, belongs to that part of the loop. So then this is the motional EMF. This is giving us a general case. VBL, you can consider like this. This equation gives us an alternative formula of Faraday's law, which is often convenient in problems with moving conductors. So what we have here, we have conductor, we have a magnetic field, constant magnetic field, let's consider, okay? And then conductor is moving in that magnetic field. We have a conductor which is moving in, in, in the magnetic field. Then we have emotional EMF within the conductor. But when we are dealing with the problems with the stationary conductors in a changing magnetic field, let's consider that this conductor is fixed here, but the magnitude of the magnetic field is changing, okay? Conductor is fixed, but magnitude of the magnetic field changes. Then the flux within that area changes and we have that expression here or that formula of Faraday's law, okay? We have um, a magnetic flux changes by time, okay? Uh, so we have a changing magnetic field, then it produces an induced EMF in a closed loop. So if you have a stationary conductor in changing magnetic field, this formula is more useful. And if you have moving conductor, 
in a magnetic field, then this formula is more useful to deal with the problems related to the emotional EMF. Here we ha do you have any question? Then let me continue with the example. Emotional EMF in the slide wire generator, which we have um, also uh, solved a similar example during the last lecture. So what we have here, suppose the moving road in that figure here, this moving road, this is stationary U-shaped conductor, and this is the moving road. This U-shaped conductor does not move. It is fixed at certain position. So this road has length of 0.1 meter, and the velocity is 2.5 meter per second. And the total resistance of the loop R is 0.03 ohm. And the B here into the page is constant, which is given by 0.6 Tesla. So what is the question? Find the emotional EMF in the circuit, find the induced current in the circuit, and then find the force acting on the road. What is the force acting on the road? So EMF is given by that expression VBL, velocity of the road, magnetic field, and length of the road. Put them here, then we have 0.15 volt EMF. And the induced current in the loop is given by that expression, I is equal to EMF over resistance of the circuit. Then we know of them, put them here. Then we have 5 amp current, induced current in the circuit. And the force acting on that road is given by I times L times B. We have done it in the previous lecture, right? So I is the current in the road, and L is the length of the road, and B is the magnetic field. Put them here, then we have 0.3 Newton. The force acting on that, that road. You can also find the direction by using right hand rule, okay? So here, uh, this is the direction of the um, current and direction of the L is chosen along the current. Then this is the direction of the B, direction of the L, direction of the B into the page. Then the magnetic, uh, the, the uh, magnetic force will be perpendicular to both of them to the opposite direction of the velocity. Okay. So let's um, continue with another example, the Faraday disk dynamo or homopolar generator. So what we have here, we have a conducting disk with radius R, this is the radius of the disk, that lies in the xy plane. This is x axis, this is y axis, and this disk is staying in xy plane and rotates with constant angular velocity omega. This is the angular velocity of the disk, and it is rotating like this around the z axis. This is the z axis, okay? This disk is in a uniform constant B field in the direction of Z. In Z direction, there is a magnetic field, blue color here, okay, direction of the magnetic field uh, along the Z direction. So what is the question? Find the induced EMF between the center and the rim of the disk. This is the center of the disk this is the rim of the disk, right? So the question is that, what is the induced EMF between the center and rim of the disk? So you take a conductor from the center and another wire from the rim of the disk, then we have a current here. So the question is, what is the uh, EMF from center 
to um, REAM and what is the current due to that EMF. So what is happening here? Emotional EMF arises because the connecting disc moves relative to B. If you choose very small element here, okay, on the disc, which is shown by this, this is the, this is the radius and this is the R from center to that element. And this is the, the R, okay small radial segment of length dr consider this small segment of the disc shown in red here let me magnify it okay this area very small segment and then um, it has certain velocity like this okay it is moving like this so if you choose small segment, then velocity is like this. If you choose small segment here, velocity will be like this. For, the, for this small segment, we have that velocity. The magnetic force per unit charge on this segment is given by Vb, okay? For the unit charge, actually force is given by Qvb. We are talking about unit charge here. And this force, points radially outward from the center of the disc. So the, the direction of the force from the center to the rim of the rod, okay, in that direction. This is the direction of the force acting on charges on that conducting disc. Thus, the induced EMF tends to make a current flow radially outward. So we have uh, EMF from center to the rim in that direction along the magnetic force acting on that charge here. So we can find the EMF from each small disc segment along this line here, okay, like this. Each segment gives us this EMF, which is given by DE, and this is the DL. And uh, but what we have here, uh, we have different velocities. This is important, okay? Um, why? It has constant angular speed and speed of that very small segment is given by omega times r, r is the distance to the center, okay? And this distance changes for each segment, okay? If you choose that segment, then distance will change, okay? Then the um, velocity of the small segment, radial segment will be changed. So don't forget this one. So the length vector dl, or dr, okay, along that line, associated with the segment points radially outward. This is the um, direction of the dl in the same direction as vb along the force. The vectors v and b are perpendicular. The direction of the v is on the xy plane, but the direction of the b is perpendicular to the xy plane, okay? Magnitude of V is given by that expression. And just take this V, put it there. Then finally, we have that EMF for, for that segment, omega B R D R, angular velocity, magnetic field here, and the distance between the center of the disc and this small segment and this dl or dr. Then if we integrate that one from center when the r is zero to the rim of the disc when the r is capital R, then we can find total EMF produced by this rotating disc. Okay, then the total EMF is given by integral from zero from center to the rim of the disc. Okay, 
if you solve that integral, you will have that EMF, one, uh, one half omega b times r square. So then what is happening? If you consider that there are positive charges here, okay, there is a magnetic force due to that magnetic field and this velocity acting on that positive charges. And this force is from center to the rim in outward direction, okay? Then positive charges will be moved like this. So you can consider that if, if, you, if, you, if you make a connection here in that point, and if you make another connection here, there will be current like this, okay? Because positive charges are moving like this. Do you have any question here? Then let me continue with induced electric fields. Here we have a long thin solenoid, this one. This is solenoid with black color, let's say, okay? And we have current in this solenoid. So by using right hand rule, you can, you can get the direction of the magnetic field in that direction. This is the direction of the magnetic field in the center of the solenoid due to the um, current here, okay? And then we have a circular conducting loop, okay? So this solenoid is placed in the center of a circular conducting loop. This is the circular conducting loop. And this is a galvanometer here in order to measure the current in that loop, okay? So if you derive current I here in that solenoid, then we will have a constant magnetic field, okay? Then you will not see something here in the galvanometer. But if you change the current in the solenoid by time, then the current is not constant here. We will have a changing magnetic field across that area of the uh, circular conducting loop, okay? So we will have a changing flux here in that area. Then due to the changing flux, we will have EMF, okay? We will have EMF and we, we will have a current in that conducting loop. This is the current changing by time in the solenoid. And then due to the changing flux, we have another current, which is shown by I prime. Okay, this is I, this is I prime. This is induced current in the conducting loop. Okay, so then let's try to calculate what is that EMF here in that conducting wire? So magnetic field due to that solenoid is given by mu zero n times I, n is the number of the turns per unit length here, and I is the current in the solenoid, okay? Mu zero is the constant. So what was the flux, magnetic flux here, okay? is given by B times A if you choose A direction parallel to the B, then we will have mu zero N I B put there and area of the conducting loop. Then what we have here, this current, look at that current, this current changes by time. If you change the current by time, then this flux, magnetic flux, will also change. If the flux changes by time, then we have EMF in that circular conducting loop. And this EMF, we know from the last lecture, that is given by minus change in the magnetic flux, okay? So uh, just put that magnetic flux here, we have minus mu zero n a, and here we have current, and this current changes by time. So since 
the current changes, we produce magnetic flux here. If the change in the current is zero, then there is no, there is no EMF here. So what is the magnitude of the current produced that in circular conducting loop? It is given by, this is I prime, EMF produced in that conductor over resistance of the circular wire. Do you have any question here? So now, okay, we have calculated the EMF in that conducting loop but we are talking about induced electric fields. So what about the electric fields here? What we have found that due to the changing current in solenoid, we have a changing flux here like this, and then we have an induced current, induced EMF, within that circular conducting loop. So what is the origin of the current here? So if there is a current in some certain circuit, you can consider that there is an electric field, right? Drives the current, you can consider like this. So if you have a current, it means that you have moving charge particles, okay? So electric field, does it. So there must be an electric field in the system. And the induced EMF can be written in terms of the induced electric field. So this was the induced EMF. This one on the right side, induced EMF in that circular loop is written in that form. Here we have induced electric field. This is the line integral of electric field around that path. Okay, this is Faraday's law for a stationary integration pass. We have EMF on the right side produced on that circular loop, and here we have electric field on the left side. So we have relation between EMF and electric field. And this electric field is called as induced electric field. Okay, now let's continue this one example, suppose the long solenoid here has 500 turns per meter. Okay, we have 500 turns here and cross-sectional area four centimeters square. This is the cross-sectional area of the solenoid and the current in its windings is increasing at 100 amp per second. So here we have current, okay, in the solenoid, and this current changes by time, okay? It is increasing at 100 amp per second. So what is the question? Find the magnitude of the induced EMF, magnitude of the induced EMF in the wire loop. So due to the changing flux here, we will have induced EMF, and find the magnitude of the induced electric field within the loop if its radius is two centimeter. This is the radius of that loop and we have induced electric field. So how to calculate this one? So um, the first one induced EMF here within that loop due to the changing current and changing flux within that solenoid. So EMF, induced EMF within that loop around the solenoid is given by that expression minus d phi b over dt. And uh, flux is given by that expression b times a cosine phi. If you choose area and b vectors are parallel to each other, then I can write as b times a and B is given by mu zero and I, okay? The magnetic field produced by the, um, by the solenoid, then this is the area. And put this magnetic flux in that equation here. Then we have this expression minus mu zero and A dI over dt. 
here we have i if you uh, put it there then we will have di over dt what is di over dt the current in the solenoid changes by time okay it is increasing with that rate 100 m per second so mu zero is constant put it there number of turns is given put it there and area is given put it there where is it this one okay and uh, the change in the current is also given put it there 100 m per second then we can calculate emf in that circular loop okay which is given by minus 25 microvolt so what is this minus minus is showing the direction of the emf okay so we have discussed this one during the last lecture how to calculate the direction of the uh, emf uh, by using that rule and how to calculate the direction of the current by using lens law okay we have discussed all the things during the last lecture so how to find the magnitude of the induced electric field within the loop so what is the electric field so we know the emf so emf is related to the induced electric field the that expression so just use this one emf here and the question asks the what is the induced electric field what is this one so um electric field in that wire is same everywhere okay with same magnitude only its um the direction changes okay but the magnitude is same and the dl integral over closed loop gives us the circumference of the loop okay then just put 2 pi r here and take this e out and this emf is given if you take electric field from that expression emf over 2 pi r will give us electric field induced electric field in that circular loop so this induced electric field is given by um, 25 microvolt over 2 pi r radius of that uh, circular loop put it there then finally we can find electric field in volt per meter okay this is the calculation of induced electric field by using that expression okay let's talk about applications of induced electric currents actually there are many many applications i will show you here um, two of them uh, this is a hybrid automobile okay it has both a gasoline engine here and those an electric motor uh, so when the car comes to a halt the spinning wheels run the motor backward so that it acts as a generator okay then the resulting induced current is used to recharge the car's batteries located on, on the bottom of the car so this is the general general um, idea behind the hybrid cars and here we have a plane a plane here we have a rotating crankshaft okay the rotating crankshaft of a piston engine airplane spins a magnet here let's say um let's say there is a magnet and this shaft spins a magnet inducing an emf in an adjacent coil you can consider like alternator which we have discussed during the last lecture okay that there are wires around here and there is a magnet and this magnet is spinning okay then this induces an emf in the coils and generates the spark that ignites fuel in the engine cylinder so what is the advantage of this one this keeps the engine running even if the airplane's other electrical system fail so this is very important 
uh, in order to ignite the fuel in the engine cylinders, you need electrical system. But if this electrical system fails, we have another electric source, okay? This system here produces an EMF, okay? Then this can also produce electricity. These are the common applications of induced electric fields in the industry. Okay, let's continue with the eddy currents. So, um, in the previous examples of the induced EMF, induced currents, we have studied very um, well-defined paths in conductors, okay? But what happens if we have many pieces of electrical equipment contain masses of metal moving in magnetic fields or located in changing magnetic fields? metal pieces like this, metal pieces like this, or metal pieces like this in a magnetic field. In situation like this, we can have induced currents so that circulate throughout the volume of the material. You can consider this one. Here we have a metal disc rotating around the magnetic field here, let's consider only at that region, blue region, we have magnetic field into the page and we rotate that metal disc, okay? So due to the rotation, we have movement of charged particles here, we have velocity, then we have magnetic field, okay? And what we have here, an induced current is produced, but the direction of the currents like this here on the right side, which is given, this is the direction of the currents, okay? Like swirling eddies in a river in Turkish, girdaplar gibi, sudaki veya denizdeki veya nehirdeki, şöyle girdap şeklinde, okay? For this reason, we call that currents eddy currents, in Turkish, girdap akımları, okay? So around that region, here we have magnetic field and this metal is rotating. Then we have eddy currents like this. So uh, due to that current, this is the, let's choose that point. We have direction of the magnetic field into the page. This is the direction of the current uh, and this is the, L, okay, if you apply F, I, L, B, okay, so then we will have force, magnetic force. So look at the direction of the force. This is the direction of the uh, rotation. This is the direction of the force opposite to the rotation, okay. So this has also many applications in automobile industry and also in many field of industry to, to halt the rotating metal objects um, very fast. Here I will show you another example of eddy currents in metal detectors. So this is metal detector, portable metal detector. And this is conventional metal detector in, in a ports also in this in the entrance of the shopping centers okay maybe you have um, entered into such metal detector several times okay so what we have here we have a transmitting coil here we have a coil and you drive current and then you produce magnetic field within that detector okay and then here we have another coil, which is receiving coil. So due to the magnetic field here, produced by this transmitting coil, there are eddy currents on metal objects if you have um, in your hand or also somewhere in, in your body, if you have metal objects 
there will be eddy currents due to that effect, okay? Metal object, and you have magnetic field, then there will be eddy currents on the metal object. So here, let's say you have metal back, you entered into the metal detector in the shopping center, then due to the magnetic field, which is constant here, okay? Due to the magnetic field, there are eddy currents on the metal objects with you. So due to that currents, look at, look at the current. If you have a current, then you will produce magnetic field, okay? So this metal objects will produce an additional magnetic field, which is shown by B prime. And this magnetic field will induce a current in that loop. And then you can, you can see that whether this guy has metal object with himself. Another application, same mechanism. The mechanism is completely the same. This is a portable metal detector. And here we have a wire, okay? And we have one coil here. This is the current in the coil, okay? Direction of the current in the uh, coil. So you produce a magnetic field, which is given by B0. And there is a metal object. This is buried metal object, okay? You cannot see it. So um, then, um, due to magnetic field, you produce eddy currents on that metal object. So due to the eddy currents, we have an additional magnetic field E prime. So we have another coil here. This is, let's say, transmitting coil, and we have also a receiving coil. So there will be a current I prime due to the eddy currents in the metal object, then you can detect the metal particles. This is the working principle of metal detectors in the shopping centers, in airports, and those portable metal detectors. Another application of eddy currents, um, this is related to the astrophysics, let's say. Here we have Jupiter, and this is the IO, the um, satellite of the Jupiter, like moon, okay? And what we have learned that there are magnetic field lines around the Earth, and Jupiter has also magnetic field lines around itself, okay? And this IO is traveling around the Jupiter because it is satellite of the Jupiter. So now let's come to the um, information. Jupiter's moon, IO, this one, is slightly larger than the Earth's moon, it moves at more than 60,000 km per hour through Jupiter's intense magnetic field. About 10 times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. Earth's magnetic field around the poles was about um, one Gauss, let's say, okay? The Earth, so the magnetic field produced by the Jupiter is 10 times stronger than the Earth's field. You can compare it, which sets up strong eddy currents within IO. So you have magnetic field, magnetic field of Jupiter, and you have metal objects. It means that there are metals, many metals in IO, okay? So you have magnetic field lines, then you have a metal object, then you can produce eddy currents. So this field of Jupiter sets up strong eddy currents within IO that dissipate energy at a rate of 10 to power 12 watt. This dissipated energy helps to heat IO's interior. So interior of the IO is heated due to that dissipated energy. And then this causes volcanic eruptions on its surface. So this is IO, if you magnify it, this is the surface of the IO. Here you see volcanic eruptions on IO here, okay? Due to the eddy currents. So this is 
another application of eddy currents or just to understand the mechanism of volcanic eruptions eddy currents will help us to understand them now uh, do you have any question here in that part then let me continue with displacement current what is displacement current we have seen that a varying magnetic field gives rise to an induced electric field this one here we have a varying magnetic field magnetic flux changes by time then this produces an induced electric field okay we have already learned that but we also know that varying electric field give rise to a magnetic field here we have varying magnetic field this produces induced electric field if you have varying electric field on the right side then we have induced magnetic fields okay so now we will see that one with the explanation of displacement current this effect is very important okay so their varying electric field gives rise to magnetic field varying magnetic field gives rise to uh, induced electric field this is very important because um, in order to explain the existence of radio waves infrared radiation uv gamma rays visible light x-rays okay all the things and all other forms of electromagnetic waves can be explained with that mechanism okay so we will go into detail so now um, let's remember the ampere's law we, we have done it so here here we have a wire let's consider okay conducting wire and you have current in that wire if you choose a pass okay a closed pass then by calculating the total enclosed current okay through that closed pass you can calculate the magnetic field we have done it during the last lectures okay so but what happens in the case of a charging capacitor so remember the circuit for the charging capacitor let's consider that we have a battery and here we have a charging capacitor this is the positive charge of the capacitor this is negative um, plate of the capacitor okay uh, due to the emf source here we have current from positive to negative in the circuit okay this is the current in the circuit then we charge the capacitor but remember that the a current in that circuit when you are charging the capacitor current is not constant current changes by time right current decreases we have discussed all the things charging and discharging capacitors you can check your lecture notes okay for this reason i show this current here in that circuit by small i okay because current changes by time during the charging of the capacitor so now uh, let's concentrate on that part here i have negative uh, plate of the capacitor on the right side negative plate of the capacitor this one and this is the positive plate of the capacitor and here i have current okay current from positive to the negative uh, sides of the emf source here that's a battery we have here so now i would like to apply ampere's law for that capacitor so look at that one i choose 
a pass for the Ampere's law. Okay, so um, in order to calculate B, I know the DL, what is DL? The closed integral over DL gives us two pi R, okay? So circumference of that uh, pass, that loop, let's say. And then I enclosed within that um, plane surface covered by that pass, right? So just, just for this plane surface, just write the I enclosed. I enclosed current passing through that surface is given by I see conduction current. I will define another current displacement current. For this reason, I show this normal current with conduction current. Okay, I see. So just instead of I enclosed, put I see conduction current. This part is very important. Try to stay on the line. If you understand this part, it will be very easy for you. So here we have pass for Ampere's law, okay? We would like to apply Ampere's law for, for, for that system. And this is the current in the plane surface defined by that pass. So we have that current here. If you write the Ampere's law, BDL is equal to mu zero, what is the current? Just conduction current for that surface. And for that pass defined for the Ampere's law. But just use that, just use this same pass, but now use another surface, this one. bulging surface okay şöyle düşünün Türkçe içi boş böyle bir şapka gibi bir takke gibi düşünün bu yüzeyi tamam tepe noktası burası içi tamamen boş so this is called as bulging surface so now you have surface here so what is the current within that surface? The I enclosed on the bulging surface is zero. Okay, if you write Ampere's law, BDL is equal to mu zero times zero. So this leads to a contradiction. Okay, Ampere's law should give us the same result, but here something is wrong. For the same pass, for the same closed pass, I cannot get the same result. Here I have that result for the same pass, but here I have that result for the same pass. Something is wrong here, okay? So now we will complete Ampere's law with the displacement current. You move positive charges from the EMF to the capacitor plate and negative charges are um, accumulate here on that side, positive, negative. So due to the charges on both sides, we will have electric field between the plates, right? We have discussed this one in the previous lectures. So the electric field and the electric flux through the surface here will increase by time because magnitude of the charges on the plates will increase. We can determine the rates of change in terms of the charge and current. So flux changes, electric field changes by time, right? And 
um, they depend on the charge and current by time. We have already discussed this one. So the instantaneous ch charge Q on that plate or also on that, that side, which is given by C times potential difference between the plates. C is the capacitance of the capacitor, okay? And for a parallel plate, parallel plate capacitor, capacitance is given by epsilon zero times area of the plate over distance between the plates, okay? This one you remember, I will not go into detail. And the potential difference between the plates is given by E times D, distance between the plates. Then assume that E is uniform in the region between the plates. I mean, um, we are talking about E is changing by time, but it is uniform, okay? Uh, it is not like this. So it can also be like this. Maybe let me, let me. Okay, you don't consider such fringes. We have uniform electric field and its magnitude changes by time due to the um, change in the charge on the capacitor plates. So uh, instead of epsilon zero, we can use epsilon if we fill this region between the capacitor plates with some certain material. We have also discussed this one in the previous chapters. Then replace uh, epsilon zero by epsilon here in every ver. Then uh, we have here charge on the capacitor, which is given by capacitance times V. Capacitance is given by that expression, put it there, and V Potential difference between the plates is given by E times D, put it there. Then we will have this expression, capacitance and potential difference. And what we have here, D cancels this D. Then here we have epsilon E times area, electric field and area of the capacitor. Here we have E times area. This is electric flux, okay? I can write it like this. E times area is the electric flux. And what is the conduction current here, this current? This current can be written by the time derivative of charge, right? Because charge changes by time on the capacitor and this can give us the conduction current here. So then just take time derivative of that expression, dq, over dt, then we have, what we have here, we have electric flux and changes by time. Here we have electric flux, changes by time because post, uh, number of positive charges, amount of positive charges, amount of negative charges are increasing by time, okay, during the charging cap capacitor. So then we have such current, okay, I can express this current, conduction current, with that expression. This is electric flux between the capacitor plates and it changes by time. So now I will define a fictitious current here between the plates. This fictitious in Turkish Hayali, this placement current can be regarded as the source of the magnetic field between the plates and the magnitude of the displacement current through that area is exactly equal to the conduction current which we have calculated here. So what do you see here? If we have a current between the plates, between the plates, then by using right hand rule, you can see that we will have magnetic field lines like this shown by the blue color, okay, due to that current. So what is the meaning of that? The change 
in the electric flux produces magnetic field lines. Okay, this is the result of the displacement current between the uh, capacitor plates. So now we can include this fictitious displacement current along with the real conduction current here, this one in Ampere's law. Remember the Ampere's law, which is given by a closed integral over a pass here, BDL, which is equal to the mu zero times I enclosed. So now here, instead of I enclosed, I use conduction current here. And in addition to that, I use displacement current here, okay, between the plates. So conduction current is given by that expression. Displacement current is also given by the same expression as we, de we, as we define the conduction current. So um, what do you see here? If you choose that pass for Ampere's law, that's at the beginning, just choose that pass and that surface and apply Ampere's law. Then for this case, the displacement current is zero here. Okay, it is zero. And Ampere's law is given by mu zero times conduction current, which is given here. But if you choose another surface, again, same pass for the Ampere's law, but now we have another surface, this bulging surface here. And what we have here, what is the conduction current? Conduction current on that surface is zero now, and the current is only given by the displacement current, which is equal to this one. So if I use same pass for the Ampere's law, I get same result, whether I use that surface or that bulging surface. This is, this is the, let's say, correction of the Ampere's law with the displacement current. The last information, and important of course, the fictitious displacement current was invented in 1865 by the Scottish physicist James Clerk Maxwell. And there is a corresponding displacement current density, uh, which is given by displacement current over the area and using the flux definition, E times area, electric field times the area. Then uh, this, um, instead of this displacement current, we can also use displacement current density in terms of change of the electric field between the capacitor plates. Okay, let's continue with the um, Maxwell's equations of electromagnetism. What we have seen in the past, we have seen Gauss law for electric fields, we have seen Gauss law for magnetic fields, okay? so all the relationships between electric and magnetic fields and their sources are summarized by four equations called Maxwell's equations, okay? So we have seen this one, if you choose a closed surface and the electric field within that closed surface is given by Q enclosed over epsilon zero, charge enclosed by surface over electric constant. This was the Gauss law for electric fields. This is the first Maxwell equation. And then um, 
if you choose a closed surface, then the um, surface integral of B is equal to zero. We have explained this one that there is no magnetic monopole in nature, okay? So then this is zero. This is the uh, Gauss law for magnetic fields. So we have seen this one already in chapter 27. We have seen this one in chapter 22, okay? So now the third Maxwell equation is this chapter's formulation of Faraday's law. We have already learned today, okay? Line integral of electric field is equal to the EMF, electromotive force, and electromotive force is given by negative of time rate of change in magnetic flux through pass. We have already seen that. And the force Maxwell equation is Ampere's law, including displacement current. Maxwell corrected Ampere's law, including displacement current into the I enclosed. Okay, line integral of magnetic field around the closed pass is given by mu zero times I enclosed, but I includes both conduction current and displacement current. And the magnitude of the displacement current is given by the time rate of change of electric flux through the pass. So we have four equations and they are very important to explain um, especially electromagnetic waves, we will see them in the next chapters. Okay, so what about the Maxwell's equations in empty space? In empty space, there is a remarkable symmetry in Maxwell's equations. In empty space, there is no material, it means that there is no charge, okay? Then these two equations are identical in form. So look at this one, charge enclosed in the first Maxwell's equation, which was the Gauss law for electric fields. So in, in the vacuum conditions, okay, in space, so in free space, there is no charge, okay, then this is zero put zero here, there is no charge. This is already um, giving us zero, okay? Then they look very identical. And look at the third and fourth equations. If there is no material, okay, just have a look, the current will be zero. There is no conductor, okay? There is no material. This will be zero, then this, force Maxwell equation will be given by that expression. Look at this one, uh, mu zero, epsilon zero, mu zero, epsilon zero, and time rate of change of electric flux uh, through the pass, okay? So what do you see here? We have very nice feature here. You change the magnetic flux, you produce electric field. You change electric flux, you produce magnetic field. In empty space, there are no conduction currents, so the line integrals of E and B around any closed pass are related to the rate of change of flux of the other field. So this changing electric flux, you can produce magnetic field. You, by changing the magnetic flux, you can produce electric field. So this is very useful mechanism and we will talk about in detail later on. Then let me finish that chapter with super, superconductivity in a magnetic field. Uh, in the previous chapters, we have seen that uh, superconductors show no resistance at very low temperatures, below critical temperature. This is temperature scale, and this is the resistivity of the material. In superconductor, superconductors, 
resistivity goes down by temperature and at certain temperature and below that critical temperature there is no resistivity okay for this reason the name is superconductor okay but what happens superconductivity if i apply magnetic field as the external field magnitude increases, the superconducting transition occurs at a lower and lower temperature. Here, I will explain this in that graph. This is again the temperature axis in Kelvin. This is zero Kelvin, and this is the magnetic field. So if there is no magnet, we have superconducting material, and there is no magnetic field at the beginning, this is the critical temperature of the um, superconducting, superconductor. This is the graph for the mercury, okay? But but um, this graph is more or less identical. I mean, their behavior is similar for all superconducting materials. Of course, the uh, critical magnetic field value and critical temperature value um, are changing from one material to another material, but the mechanism is more or the same. So uh, what we have here, if there is no magnetic field, the critical temperature is here. If I apply this magnetic field, what do you see? Critical temperature is decreased. If I apply higher magnetic fields, I have critical temperature of this one. So if I apply enough magnetic field, the critical temperature is zero, okay? Superconducting transition occurs at the lower, lower, lower temperatures, okay? And then you can destroy the superconductivity by applying critical magnetic fields. This is the magnetic field dependence of the superconducting critical temperature. So now let's finish with the Meissner effect. What is the Meissner effect? This is very nice feature of superconducting materials and it has many many applications i will show you some of them if we place a superconducting material in a uniform applied magnetic field and then lower the temperature until the superconducting transition occurs so we increase we decrease the temperature and then material becomes superconducting in that range and then there is a uniform magnetic field Okay, so let, let, let me show you like this. Here we have a superconducting material and then we have uniform magnetic field. V. So in that condition, temperature is higher than critical temperature. It means that we are staying at red range and material is not superconductor. If we lower the temperature until the superconducting transition occurs this material becomes superconducting then this field lines will be expelled like this if this is not superconducting field lines are like this but whenever superconducting transition occurs this magnetic field lines around the superconducting material are expelled, okay? Magnetic flux is expelled from the material and the field inside the superconducting material is zero. This is called as Meissner effect and this is the property of the superconducting materials. So, then what about application? So just remember the information on paramagnetic and diamagnetic materials, which we have discussed during the last lecture. The Meissner effect makes a superconductor a perfect diamagnet. Remember the diamagnetic materials. So um, in diamagnetic materials, we have no net magnetization of the atoms and then the net magnetization of the system is zero, okay? But in case of a paramagnetic material, we have magnetic atoms. If you apply magnetic field, 
to that atoms, then they are aligned along the magnetic field, then they can be attracted by a permanent magnet. The paramagnetic material can be attracted by a permanent magnet. For a diamagnetic material, the magnetization is in the opposite sense, and a diamagnetic material is repelled by a permanent magnet. Okay, remember the behavior of the diamagnetic materials, which we have done it during the last lecture. This is the magnetic field, external magnetic field. This is the magnetization of the diamagnetic materials. They are like this. In case of paramagnetic materials, I can show it like this. This is the magnetic field. This is the magnetization of the paramagnetic materials. And magnetization is like this. Linear, okay? But here in diamagnetic materials, the behavior is opposite. So a diamagnetic material is repelled by a permanent magnet, but a paramagnetic material is attracted by a permanent magnet. So what we have here, this is a superconducting material, and here we have a permanent magnet. So uh, since superconductors are perfect diamagnetic materials, then they repel the permanent magnets, as we have explained here. So there is a repulsion between material, which is superconductor, and permanent magnet. So what about the applications? Look at this one. This black material is superconducting material, and the guy adds some liquid nitrogen into that cane, okay? Then superconducting transition occurs. This black material becomes superconductor, okay? And there is a repulsive force between permanent magnet and superconductor. So when the temperature goes above the critical temperature, the material um, loses its superconductivity and the system does not work, okay? Now just add liquid nitrogen and then cool the superconducting material below TC, then put permanent magnet. There is a repulsion between permanent magnet and superconducting material, okay? And if you take them out of the liquid nitrogen, okay, then the temperature increases, then superconductivity is lost. So what about the application of this one? This is used in maglev trains, magnetic levitation trains. So what do you see here? This is a superconducting material. These are the permanent magnets arranged in special order. Okay, this is just a demonstration. So what do you see here? That superconducting material is traveling on that way, okay? So there is no friction. So you can use it in maglev trains without friction between the trains and rails, okay? You can reach very fast speeds. So indeed, they are applied in maglev trains. This Meissner effect has many technological applications with that property. So with that transparency, I finished my lecture. If you have any questions, I will try to answer them. Any question? Okay, see you then. Bye-bye.